Joanna, have you always loved poetry? I'm simply addicted to it, actually. Um, I've loved it since I was a child for the reasons that, what, I don't think my parents read me poetry, but I had a kind of a feeling I liked the sound of the pattern it made. I found I could learn it very quickly. I loved the, the, sh the shrunkenness of words, that just a few words could make such a delicious taste, such a brilliant image. And I became a bit obsessed with it, and I am to this day. I keep poetry books beside my bed. I have a special um, book, little book shelf, which is only for poetry. Mm. Um, and I love it. I want people to learn it. Does it comfort you? I love it. I take it, um, particularly on trips and trains, and when I do my long documentary series, which quite often take me out of the country for three, four weeks at a time, I try to learn poetry. I'm getting worse at it. I used to have a photographic memory and I could just absorb it. But you used to memorise poetry? Always, always memorised it, At yes. school, presumably. At school, well, you had to do it as a punishment sometimes. Um, but that was a delight for me because I, if they gave me one to learn as a punishment, I'd learn three <laughs> and go and you know, speak to the, to the prefects like that. Um, but I do try to learn them. And I find that if you, if you, if you read them aloud, to you get the metre of how the poet meant it to sound. There's a big debate, should poetry be read through your eyes and into your head, that silent voice, or should it be declaimed out loud? Mm. And interesting people like Ted Hughes have put together uh, things that are for saying out loud. You know, they made compilations poetry for declaiming, or poetry that is really to be absorbed. And do you sometimes walk around saying them out loud? No, I'm th I haven't quite <laughs> reached that stage yet, but it's obviously coming upon me <laughs> pretty soon. But whenever I can, I bore people to death. I think you've chosen a poem um, by John Masefield, who I remember studying at school. Yes, I love John Masefield. But this is one of the earliest ones. And what I love about this is the, it's three verses. It's called cargoes, i.e. the stuff that ships carry on them in the days when there were no aeroplanes to take stuff around the world. And he captures completely three different kinds of ships with three different kinds of cargoes. Listen especially to the last verse, yeah. because what I love is that when he comes to the, the British, the little... Um, little kind of dirty ship in the channel. Everything is staccato, chop, chop, chop words. So while the first two verses are languid and luscious from sort of Central Asia and Palestine and places, the last one is chop, chop, chop. Brilliant. He's a brilliant man. Okay. So it's called Cargoes. Quinquereme, incidentally, quinquereme means five ranks of oars. So you can imagine five rows of galleys of mm. slaves tsh, dipping and pulling. Quinquereme of Nineveh from distant Ophir, rowing home to Haven in sunny Palestine with a cargo of ivory and apes and peacocks, sandalwood, cedarwood and sweet white wine. Stately Spanish galleon coming from the isthmus, dipping through the tropics by the palm green shores with a cargo of diamonds, emeralds, amethysts topazes and cinnamon and gold moidores. Dirty British coaster with a salt-caked smokestack butting through the channel in the mad March days with a cargo of tyne coal, road rail, pig lead, firewood, ironware and cheap tin trays. <laughs> Great. Great. You're right. All that lovely alliteration yes. in the first two verses, very sensuous, and yes. then suddenly you're brought up d completely to a halt. Ugly, messy. Mm. Very good. Wonderful. Yeah. I chose, can I do another one? Yes, of course. Um, I'd, what I'd love I, you to read another what one. I, what I love very much about poetry is that it can sometimes tell you a kind of story, and it takes you into um, a different world, where if you let your mind roam, Obviously, particularly as a child, I was obsessed by things like The Lady of Shalott, huge, long dramas, and you could see it unrolling before your eyes. Yes. And for that reason, I loved Walter de la Mer, who had, he had an artist's eye. He had the most extraordinary selection of images, and always spooky. You never get away from a ghost with Walter de la Mer. And as you say, always telling a story, or always telling, telling a story, a story or creating some extraordinary moment where you feel slightly spooked, you're never safe with him. I love this. Great. And this one is called The Listeners. In itself, a terrifying title, if you think about it. Is there anybody there? Said the traveller, knocking on the moonlit door. And his horse in the silence champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor. And a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveller's head. 
and he smote upon the door a second time. Is there anybody there? he said. But no one descended to the traveller. No head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes, where he stood perplexed and still. But a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men, stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall, hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call. And he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf neath the starred and leafy sky. For he suddenly smote on the door even louder and lifted up his head. Tell them I came and no one answered, that I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. Aye, they heard his foot upon the stirrup and the sound of iron on stone and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hoofs were gone. Great. It's very haunting. It's very haunting. He loves this. He loves to leave you uneasy. And it makes you think differently about the place you are, no matter where you are, whether it's in a modern house or an old one or a long school hall. You suddenly feel the presence of other people who've been there before, who yes. haven't quite gone away. Yes, that's brilliant. I think you also love Keats, don't you, as a, a poet? Um, I love Keats, and funny enough, it was my sister, who's a tremendous bookworm, who said, Keats is much overlooked. He's one of the finest poets there ever was. And although the words he uses are sometimes a bit old-fashioned, and he's talking about a time so far away from today, when people winnowed the crops they brought in and people understood the smell of barns and the sound of the end of a day of harvest and things like this. His evocation of evening and autumn and the heat of an English summer fading away is staggering, the end of a hot year. Well, I'd love you to read that very famous poem, Ode to Autumn. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd, and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amidst thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind or in a half-reaped furrow, sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swathe and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too, while barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a wailful choir, the small gnats mourn along the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies. And full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born, hedge crickets sing. And now, with treble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden croft. And gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Listening to you, one can see why so many people think it's one of the most perfect poems 
in the language. I think Harold Bloom, the American professor, says it's the most perfect, shorter poem in English. Well, I think Harold's absolutely spot on. I think there's something about the exceptional observation of things like little gnats mm. and swallows. That attention to detail. That absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And also the way it moves from morning, busy morning, into the afternoon in the yes. second stanza and, and then into sleeping. dusk. And there's a very famous poem, um, painting, and I can't, it's not Rossetti, somebody, um, one of the pre-Raphaelites of a drowsing woman with poppies, she's asleep and she's just absolutely in slumber, golden, it's called golden slumber or harvest or something, a very, very famous pre-Raphaelite painting, and I know that comes from this. Yes. That's the one she's been cutting and the poppies and you're so tired and you just rest your head. It's just enchanting. Wonderful. It's almost mm. as if it becomes autumn. It is. <laughs>